Hello and welcome to today's webinar on the Functional Program and Safety Risk Assessment, How to Create and Apply Them. This is one of 10 webinars hosted by the Facility Guidelines Institute on the 2018 Guidelines for Design and Construction Documents. I'm Heather Livingston, Director of Operations for FGI and Managing Editor of the 2022 edition of the Guidelines, and I'm happy to be your moderator during today's webinar. FGI is pleased to host this series of continuing education webinars developed to broaden understanding of the guidelines documents, the revision process, and to highlight key changes in the current edition of the guidelines. To obtain AIA credit, you will need to coordinate with the person who registered your organization on MADCAD. That person will be receiving follow-up directions by email. Each attendee seeking AIA learning units must complete a 10-question quiz on the content of this webinar in order to receive AIA continuing education credit. The views and opinions expressed during today's presentation are those of the presenters and may not represent the official position of FGI nor the HGRC. Now it's my pleasure to introduce today's presenters. Ken Cates is the co-founder and principal of North Star Management Company in St. Louis. He's worked on over 1,000 projects representing a cumulative value of more than $5 billion. Ken is the president of FGI's board of directors and has been a member of the Health Guidelines Revision Committee since 1995. Ken was instrumental in revising and consolidating the functional program requirements for the 2014 edition of the guidelines and was an early advocate for inclusion of the safety risk assessment. Ellen Taylor is vice president for research at the Center for Health Design where she leads multiple research and grant funded initiatives. She has a degree in architecture from Cornell University, MBA degrees from Columbia University and London Business School, and a PhD in human factors and designing for patient safety from Loughborough University in the UK. She serves on the executive steering committee for the FGI Health Guidelines Revision Committee and the editorial advisory board of the Heard Journal and the American Journal of Infection Control. Welcome Ken and Ellen, and thank you very much for being with us today. Thanks, Heather. This is uh, Ken Cates, and today I'm going to talk to you about the basics of functional programming, and along the way, maybe offer a few considerations that are beyond fundamentals. So when we take a look at the basics of functional programming as defined in the guidelines, um, there are several sections related to uh, the functional program, and I'm going to break it down into purpose, content, how to go about developing a functional program, and then ultimately how to use it, some of the benefits you realize. So let's get started. The number one question I get, what is the point of doing a functional program? A lot of healthcare executives uh, ask this and say, is it worth the time? Does it really make a difference? And uh, I, know, I know I'm only a data point of one person, but in my years of experience in project management, I have found the functional program to be one of, if not the most critical item uh, that leads to a successful project. So on this slide, what you see here are the uh, sort of the reasons why we put together functional programming. We talk about the rationale for the project. Why is the owner doing this project? How is it going to be used? Really operational kind of information that is written in text form. This is paragraphs that describe this. This then can be used as the basis of design. The functional program informs the design. Uh, it's also uh, an opportunity to identify which guideline requirements are going to be used, essentially which parts or sections are going to be used to design the facility. And uh, also included as part of this is any other codes and standards that are going to be used to design it. Another purpose of the functional program is it really provides the basis for a, an authority having jurisdiction review and approval. Um, we have heard from many, many, many AHJs how, how valuable the functional program is for them to take in an easy one place, uh, easy read in one place to learn about the project, what's the rationale, what are the parts and pieces related to the the facility plan. So it, that is a big purpose of the functional program. But also, I think what we've tried to do in crafting language in the guidelines um, is to bring focus to patient and staff safety. 
Uh, this is something that Ellen is going to talk about in the second half of this webinar, but it's really an important purpose of the functional program to early on have conversations and document uh, what the goals are related to patient and staff safety. I mean, ultimately, um, we're trying to ensure a successful facility project outcome, and what you'll hear from me over the course of this presentation is some ways that I think uh, you can do that. So, um, in addition to the purpose of the business or operational side, there's lots of information in a functional program related to the PDC process. And I find it initially to be an invaluable planning tool. So, you know, this, this sort of, this notion of a functional program is not new. It's been around for a long time. In fact, many AHJs have been requiring it because it does expedite reviews and approvals, and not only by AHJs, but executives within the organization. Essentially, it becomes the storybook of the project. It tells the story. Here's why we're doing it. Here's what's going to get included. and Here's the various components associated with the facility project. Uh, when it comes to scope and scale of, of this document, it can be from a couple pages to 400 pages. Really, one size does not fit all. Depends on the complexity and overall size of the project. And as I sum up here on this slide, I, I just think it's an invaluable planning tool for the reasons that are listed here. And, and I think what's important to note is that this document starts in the planning phase and it continues to be updated and used throughout the entire process. If you follow that logic I'm using about it being a storybook of the project, you need to keep updating it and have uh, people as they come into the project review it. It really gets people up the learning curve quickly. So when do you need a functional program? Well, per the guidelines, this is, uh, this is what is in all of the documents. And as you can see, it's located in the same section across all three of our guidelines documents in part one. And I just wanted to point out here, uh, relative to the guidelines revision committee work that's been done to craft the language, there was a big emphasis uh, leading up to the 2018 guideline to really improve the definition of a functional program, what's the content uh, that should be included, and to eliminate um, really over 600 references throughout the document to functional programming. There used to be a lot more references in the guidelines uh, to using the functional program. So we've really tried to streamline that and make it clear to understand, easy to interpret what is expected. So by now, I think you've got the picture, the functional program answers everything, right? Well, you know, it answers a lot of questions about the facility project and key elements associated with it. But besides the facility perspective, when you look kind of beyond the guidelines, um, I interpret it as an owner, owner's manual. So on the next slide, what you'll see is a number of items that uh, I have found to be beneficial to the owner. And this is not only in informing the facility project, as I said, but think about an owner's manual that all of these goals and assumptions are put into this document in written form. And at some point uh, when the project has, is being developed, the owner typically will develop a transition operations plan and activation plan. And I find the functional program information to be a very helpful in crafting that and getting staff onboarded with the logic behind the facility. Um, again, form follows function, and um, so I, I think that it has a, a just a great purpose in helping the owner's staff in understanding how to operate the facility. So let's spend a few minutes on the typical content that is in a functional program. On this slide, what you see is language that is included uh, in the guidelines. Um, what I wanted to emphasize on this slide is that the governing body or its delegate develops the functional program, essentially the owner. There's a lot of uh, reason uh, behind putting that kind of language into the guidelines, primarily from experience from a number of people uh, that do functional programs all the time 
recognizing that the owner is key to developing this information. And if you just think about what I talked about earlier about the content, there's a lot in there about operations, um, rationale for the project, all that needs to come from the owner. And from Ken Cates's view of the world of having done a lot of these, it really is a secret ingredient to getting the owner organized. As we all know, owner organizations have very complex administrative structures. And oftentimes, you're trying to pull people together from different perspectives, CFO, COO, CEO, into a room and agree on what is the purpose of this project? What's it gonna look like? How is it going to operate? Um, so having the owner in the position of being responsible and really heavily engaged in the development of this content is essential. All right, so let's look at some of the specifics of the content of the program. Obviously, um, the purpose of the project in a narrative form is shown. And um, uh, then you have project type and size. This is basically saying, is it a hospital? Is it an outpatient? Is it a residential facility? Is it new construction? Is it renovation? And then, um, and then an associated architectural space program with it. For components and scope, this really is about listing the services and functions uh, related to the project. And um, this is also a great place where you can document which guidelines requirements are going to be used in the design. And as I said earlier, also any other codes and standards. I like to see in one place which requirements are going to be used. This is very helpful for the AHJs, but it's also very helpful for the design team. Indirect support functions. Um, you know, to demonstrate holistic thinking as we plan these facilities, this is really an important one to address and have some language in uh, regarding um, in a narrative form that talks about what are the operational assumptions that we're making related to the support services that are going to take care of services provided in our project. Um, oftentimes, facilities are done and you think about the box with, with, with which with you are working in and not a lot of thought related to how does that ripple through the organization and impact other support services. And oftentimes you will find that the support service spaces are not sized uh, appropriately to handle or not set up appropriately to handle what you're doing with the new program. So that's why this is an important piece of the content. And then finally, operational requirements and considerations where you, you, know, you break it down into uh, services and volumes. This, this ties to the intended use piece at the beginning. And this is the, the place to put your safety risk assessment information, which Ellen is going to talk about here um, in a minute. So um, the, the typical content in a functional program, and as defined in the guidelines, but I think is typically done as an industry standard, are these kind of things. Now, I wanted to mention some additional considerations uh, for you, depending on the organization uh, and what the use of the document will be. What, but what I see that has been helpful is providing this kind of information um, um, in the document. You know, what happens is we get people together in these discussions and talk about functional program content like I just talked about. And oftentimes, other information gets identified. So we like to capture that. And while it may not be for all audiences, you do have it in one place as sort of an executive storybook. Um, blocking, stacking, cost and schedule information, um, all of these sorts of things. I would just recommend that you consider as you initiate your functional program process and you have your team assembled, talk about that table of content and see if there are other things that will help you in the future. All right, the next slide talks about uh, functional program development. Now that you know all the stuff that needs to go into the thing, how do you get it all done? Number one is you've got to assemble a multidiscipline team. And as I said earlier, that's led by the owner, but it is a multidiscipline team that includes the senior level folks. You have planners. There's lots of different folks that um, are involved to inform the functional program. And what I have found to be successful is you initiate this at the beginning of the thought process of a project. You involve more people rather than less people 
in the conversation so that your functional, your initial functional program is holistic thinking, is comprehensive, and is better understood by all the various stakeholders. And then you see here, you know, it's updated at each phase of the project and then issued to, to people associated with the project. I found workshops to be helpful to get people in the room. Um, otherwise, you wind up with sort of disjointed agendas or information feeding into it, and then you hope someday when you put it all in one piece that everybody reads it. When you're together in a workshop and you can review all that and you have all those perspectives sitting in the room, very, very helpful. Um, I think the biggest issue on developing the functional program is the last item here, thoughtful writing and readable graphics. Um, I just encounter this all the time that many people struggle with reading, uh, writing, and then, then the audience that reads it is confused by what is put in there. My recommendation is appoint someone on that team that knows how to write, knows how to edit, and have them really take the lead on putting together the document. Because think about your audience. This is going to be used by a lot of different people associated with the project. So it needs to be written clearly that people get the message, okay? All right, so uh, the next slide is, you know, making sense of all this information. Lots and lots of information uh, coming together. And um, I know there are many different audiences, as I mentioned, that are looking at this information, but I wanted to zero in on a couple of the really uh, important, key important audiences that use the functional program. And that is the authority having jurisdictions and the executives. So when you look at a, an AHJ review process, sort of what is the typical thing that an AHJ does on the next slide, you'll see um, these are, you know, while, while every AHJ has their specific requirements and their review styles, and they vary greatly. This is typically the process associated with an AHJ. And what I want to point out here is think about the perspective that the AHJ has in reviewing the information. What are they really trying to do? I think they're trying to make sure we have a safe facility. Certainly, we want the facility to comply with the requirements, the guidelines requirements, the other codes and standards. But if you think about the perspective, uh, we want to be able to demonstrate in the language and information that is used in here that we have a safe facility. So when you write information or you have this person on your team that's writing, think about the various perspectives and particularly the AHJ and write information that's going to relate to them that's going to answer their questions. Okay. The next slide then goes into the executive review. I've got a couple slides here. Just This is an important perspective. So when we convince organizations and owners to take the lead and to actively participate in this, um, they, what I have found is they have a lot of questions beyond bricks and mortar. And this, um, this is a list of those kinds of things. Um, and, and, and this information I know is beyond the fundamentals shown in the guidelines, but I offer it to you for consideration that when you're going to go through this effort and you're going to have people working together, what other kinds of questions do we need to address in the functional program? And I think it's fair to say to that team, hey, what are these other questions? And executives, what kind of things do you want us to look at? So I'm trying to give an example here. And on the next slide, um, same sort of thing. You know, there's lots of operational concerns, questions that are going to come up from those conversations. So um, I think if we build into the content of a functional program uh, information that addresses those concerns, our leaders will own it uh, more so, and it really helps us <laughs> uh, from changes. Uh, and that's the whole point here is let's get information documented, rely on it, and move forward. Okay, finally, um, some benefits to consider here. You know, when you use the mindset of the functional program, there's a number of things related to facilities. There's a number of things related to patient care. And overall, when you look at it, the benefits, uh, as shown here on this slide, um, these kind of things do work when you put together a thorough uh, functional program. And I would say these are great talking points for you to use in convincing um, your project team members in doing a functional program. So high level, pretty quick snapshot, 
I hope it helps. Ellen, I'm going to turn it over to you. Great. Thanks, Ken. So there's many things that we're going to talk about with the safety risk assessment that really echo some of the things that Ken just talked about with the functional program. So to start out, the, the safety risk assessment is applicable to all three documents, just like the functional program is. So we have this in the hospital document, we have it in outpatient, and we have in residential. And what I'm going to run through are some high-level whys we need an SRA in addition to some of the high-level how do you go about conducting an SRA and then what is actually considered during the SRA process. So many of you are probably familiar with the 1999 and 2001 IOM reports. Um, and what we really found out is that there is an incredible amount of preventable harm that's happening in healthcare facilities. And there's a cost associated with that. So there are some research studies that have identified some of these costs, and there was a, an infection control study that was done in 2010 that found that an infected patient was $43,000 more to treat than a non-infected patient with nearly 20 days more in length of stay. And this is the case for falls as well, the cost of a faller being more than $13,000 more than somebody who didn't fall with a length of stay of six or more days. And then you can look down at issues such as immobility. So this is something that hasn't necessarily been considered as much in the past, but somebody who walks 600 steps from the first to second 24-hour day from discharge will be released two days earlier than those who didn't. So these are all important considerations in terms of the first cost that you may consider in terms of designing for safety and the ongoing cost of adverse events that are going to happen over the 30 to 50 years that you're going to be operating that facility. So if we go to the next slide, I had mentioned the IOM reports from 1999 and 2001, and these figures that up to 98,000 patients die annually as a result of medical error um, may even be underestimated. It may even be higher than that. But people were so shocked by the numbers that we really lost track of a primary message that came out in these reports, that it wasn't about the fault of a person. Nobody goes into work thinking, today I'm going to make a big mistake, that it really comes from this notion of how things function together as a system. And some of that can really be influenced by how we design. And that can be the design of work process, but it can importantly also be part of the design of a facility process. So I think one of the challenges that we all face is some of the silos that happen in healthcare. And this happens all of the time in the planning in terms of how information is gathered. Um, but in terms of the first costs and the ongoing costs, we also typically have that separation between operation and capital. So really trying to understand how does the design of a facility really tie into the long-term operational benefits similar to some of the things that Ken just talked about in the functional program. So if we look at some of the basic requirements for the safety risk assessment, the first one is fairly straightforward. All projects need to be designed to facilitate the safe delivery of care. And similar to the functional program, this should be conducted by a multidisciplinary team, and it is initiated and managed by the owner's governing body. It happens early in the process, but as we have here with Young Frankenstein, it's alive and it evolves throughout the project. So ongoing, during your design process, you're going to be revisiting, you're going to be updating, you're going to be sharing that with the different team members. So if we think about the environment as one layer of defense, think through how, when you're going through a design process, how you're also incorporating, what is the model of care going to be? How is care going to be delivered? What is the workflow and the process? Who are the people that we're providing care for? Who are the people that are going to be working in the facility? And all of these will be integrated into your considerations around designing for safety. So let's look at what's actually included in the safety risk assessment as identified by the guidelines. So this was introduced in 2014 as a fundamental standard, and it does take into account more than patient safety. It includes staff safety as well. And we look at these components that are beyond the typical life safety, fire prevention types of measures. This really starts to look at issues of infection control, patient handling, fall prevention, medication safety, injury associated with behavioral health, patient immobility, and security. As it applies in the residential document, it's the same general categories, um, but they may be um, phrased slightly differently. So in the residential document, it's patient handling and transfer and mobility. 
so two and six are somewhat combined. Um, in the outpatient document, patient immobility is not included because this really is an issue of bed stays. So if we look at who would be included on the safety risk assessment team, it is multidisciplinary, as we've talked about and as Ken mentioned in the functional program. And what you really want to try and do is get many diverse perspectives so that you really are coming up with the optimal solutions related to these different types of hazards that can exist within healthcare facilities. So you want some frontline caregivers, you want facility management, you want quality improvement team members, you want people from safety and security, you want your infection preventionists. Obviously, the architecture design engineering team will be part of this. Um, looking at human factor specialists, if they're available, ergonomists. You want as many people as possible coming from different points of view to be able to inform what happens within your safety risk assessment process. So I've talked about it as being a process, and the goal is really to be proactive about thinking about safety during design so that you're thinking through from a systems approach, how can design support the operation of the facility and support safety, mitigate risk, and what you're really trying to do is improve outcomes and you're trying to make sure that you're not gonna run into expensive change orders at some point down the road. You're trying to make sure that you're not gonna run into retrofits or worse after the facility opens workarounds. So what you're really going to be looking at is what is the nature of the project? What data do you have at hand? What might you already know in terms of medication safety or patient handling injuries with staff or the types of infections that the facility and the organization has struggled with in the past. It's not necessarily indicative of what will happen in the future, but it's important to understand where the problems might exist. And then you're really going to look at some of these different areas of consideration and try and figure out what is the potential degree of harm that we might have here? And what is the potential risk? How often might this happen? And how serious might that event actually be? So you're going to look at some of these underlying conditions of design and really look at what is the acoustic environment like? What are the potentials for interruptions and distraction? Do we have adequate lighting levels? What is the quality of the light? What are the surfaces that we're specifying in terms of infection or um, falls or any, any of these other safety conditions? You're really looking at many different conditions that may apply to different types of safety events. So the guidelines requires a reporting process, and it's to be included within the planning, design, and construction activities. So you're really going to identify what are the hazards and risks as, you've, as you're working through this process. And then you're really going to decide what are the design features that can contribute to safety, and what are some of the strategies that we can think about that might reduce the risk or mitigate the risk or, in the best case scenario, actually eliminate the hazard altogether. So an example that you might think about might be, say, a hand hygiene sink. So you could say the location of a hand hygiene sink might contribute to safety. The design of the actual sink itself, the specification and selection of the sink, um, might actually be influential in reducing the level of harm associated with splashing or with some other features in terms of water um, laying within the system. So again, there's different ways to look at this in terms of very direct contributions to safety and something that may be more indirect. And in terms of compliance, you're really going to document this. This will be in the form of a safety risk assessment report. It's going to be something that is updated throughout the course of the project. And you want to make sure that any changes to the original plans get communicated to the team. I think we've all been in the position where we find out that decisions were made at some point in the past and people aren't really familiar with what that change included. And sometimes something pretty important to the project gets eliminated just because the right people weren't involved in that conversation. So I'm going to start looking at some of the specific um, categories and components of the safety risk assessment. Um, we talked about seven that exist. And the first one has to do with infection control. And the ICRA is something that people are probably very familiar with in the context of the guidelines. This has been around since the mid-1990s, I think 96 was when this was introduced, when Ken started to become involved with the FGI. Um, and infection control has to do with transmission by air, water, or contact. And hand hygiene is recognized as one of the primary aspects to prevent infection transmission. 
Um, so we're really trying to look at how does design influence these different types of transmission and how can design be used to break that chain of transmission. So you're going to look at considerations like the air handling systems, plumbing, the surfaces and material selection that you're making. And again, this is something that is going to be considered throughout the planning process. So it's going to be updated continually. And we typically focus on construction, but it needs to focus on design as well. So let's look at some of the design issues. So you're going to start looking at the types of rooms that you're providing within a facility. If it's an acute care facility, what types of isolation rooms do you need? How many do you need? What is the patient population that you're serving? Is there anything that is specific to the demographics within your area? Are there regional issues that might need to be taken into account when you're looking at some of these requirements? Where might you need HEPA filtration? What are some of the other technical aspects of the HVAC system that you might think about that could prevent infection or control infection or mitigate the risk of transmission? Um, we talked a little bit about hand, wash hand washing stations, also looking at gel dispensers and really understanding what are some of the other risks associated with water, Legionella, standing water, um, different things that may tie into how we look at how the plumbing system is designed. And then, as I had mentioned, looking at the selection of materials and finishes and furniture and making sure that things are easily cleaned. So in terms of construction, I think this is where people start to become a little bit more familiar with an ICRA. Um, we often look at these mitigation um, types of components and we're really trying to decide how is a construction project really going to disrupt the ongoing um, operation of a facility? So you're going to look at issues around air quality and water quality and you know, how is the dust moving throughout the facility? What types of particles do we need to be worried about? How is it moving from one portion inside the building to the next portion? What's happening with transmission coming from outside to inside? Um, looking at other hazards, whether it's associated with the ongoing operations of MEP systems or gas lines, and looking at the patient populations that are affected. So are you working near a patient population that's immunocompromised, or are you working near a critical care unit, or is it just a med surge unit? So that's when you really start looking at the construction mitigation solutions on the next slide, and this is often associated with an ICRA matrix. And most organizations have become pretty familiar with this and are becoming more and more adept at actually working through the control and risk mitigation during construction. Um, this is something that is often required within an organization. Many organizations actually have these forms and evaluations online where you're going to look at the type of construction, you're going to look at the adjacencies above, below, next to, and really look at these different issues related to patient placement. Do people need to be located to another area? What barriers are we going to put in place to make sure that dust doesn't move from one area to the other? How are we going to phase this? How are people going to be protected from demolition? What happens when materials are being removed? How do we make sure that we're training the staff and the construction personnel with what needs to happen to make sure that we're not creating some system of pathogens being transmitted into an existing patient population? So again, this is an area where people may be more familiar, um, but it's still foundational, and increasingly there needs to be a focus on the design portion of that. So patient handling is also an area that has been in the guidelines for a little bit longer. This was introduced in 2010. And it's important to understand that this isn't just about the morbidly obese. Um, one of the important components to understand within patient handling is that according to NIOSH, anything more than 35 pounds should not be lifted manually. And I was talking to somebody recently who manages the ergonomics within their system. And she was saying, just imagine a factory worker picking up an engine on the line. That just would not be acceptable. It wouldn't even be something that you would think about doing. And yet we often ask our nurses and other caregivers to lift patients in ways that are just not safe for both the staff and the patient. So what we really need to do is look at what are the different areas within the project that we're really going to be touching? How do those functions differ? What are the requirements within those different areas? And again, not just looking at the morbidly obese or bariatric patients, it's really patients of size and it's really any patient in reality. 
So from a design perspective, um, you're going to start looking first at a needs assessment and really understanding who are the patients that we're serving? What is the type of risk associated with the type of patient that we're looking at? Is it an elderly patient, for example? Um, is it something to do with the type of medical treatment that they've had that may make them more vulnerable? So you're really trying to look at the specifics for each project within each area, and then understanding there is a vast array of technology that is available for patient handling. What is the technology that best serves those different purposes? and really trying to understand how do we use this equipment? How much of each type of equipment do we really need? What are the capacities for the different equipment? And importantly, where will the equipment be used and stored? And what are the installation requirements if it's something that's gonna be fixed within the facility? So the phase two part of the patient handling and moving assessment really gets into the design considerations. If you're using something like overhead ceiling lifts, what are the structural considerations for that? How do we make sure that um, the, the weight of the patient and the lift can actually be supported adequately? Um, electrical and mechanical considerations are hugely important, and this ties into coordination with ceiling layout as well. Understanding how that unit will be charged if it's an overhead fixed unit and where that power supply needs to happen. Really planning through how these lifts work to make sure that they don't conflict with lighting or with um, return grills or with supply grills and really taking into account how this system is going to work within the space. That also ties into how much space do you need. Sometimes mobile equipment will require more space for use than uh, an overhead ceiling lift. Understanding what are the destination points? Are we going to go into the bathroom? Are we stopping at the bathroom door? What are the required opening sizes if you're going to have a caregiver that's assisting at the same time? And even material finishes, what are the flooring surface characteristics that you need to take into account so that if it's mobile equipment, it can actually move correctly, and if it's an overhead um, piece of equipment that the patient can actually mobilize while they're using it. So if we go on to the next topic, this is a related topic, looking at fall prevention. Obviously, there's a balance between patient handling and when you want somebody to actually get up and move themselves. And this is often an area where falls comes into play. So somebody often will fall on their way from the bed to the toilet area, but falls happen anywhere within a facility, and it's not just patients. It also applies to staff, and many workers have injuries associated with different areas within the hospital. So many of the things that we talk about with fall prevention are applicable to patients, but we need to think about it in the context of staff as well. So in a similar way to patient handling, we're gonna be thinking about who is at risk and why. So are the patients that we're looking at elderly? Are the patients that we're looking at compromised in some way that is specific to their care? You know, are they an orthopedic patient? Are they a neuro patient? So we're really trying to understand what is the extent of a temporary type of condition versus something that be, may be more intrinsic to that patient that is an ongoing issue of care. So if we look at some of the design considerations, these will apply um, to both new construction and renovation. We're really looking at patient rooms, whether it's an inpatient room or some type of an exam space, making sure that there is space for other people to be in the room that may be able to assist, making sure that there's room to navigate with an IV pole especially, making sure that there's room to navigate with a caregiver, the opportunity to have grab bars and handrails, um, really making sure that the lighting at night is suitable. Again, this is a time when most people, that's when they're gonna get up to use the toilet. Um, so making sure that they have that visibility that they need to be able to get to the bathroom and understand where the bathroom is. And obviously eliminating clutter and tripping hazards. That is probably one of the more common issues that comes up. And it's not just operational. It's not just about keeping the floor clean. It's about making sure that there's enough space to keep stuff that we don't end up with clutter. Um, so whether we use lifts or not obviously ties into patient handling as well. And then really looking at the design of the toilet room, the materials that we're looking at, noise which may impair somebody's sleep, and visibility and technology that may be available as well. So again, there's a lot of considerations to look at when we're looking at falls. Um, patient immobility, I moved this one up just because there is this very direct relationship between patient handling and patient falls. 
um, there's a, a balance that needs to be reached with the organization to understand when are you going to ask patients to mobilize versus when they're in a condition that you really want to use that lift or to have some type of technical assistance. Um, but the real goal here is to make sure that patients are getting out of bed as soon as they can and designing an environment that allows them to do that. So how are we locating things in a way that the patient can move from one place to another? Um, where is that patient chair actually best located within a room? What are the things that we're offering within hallways and corridors, for example, that may allow somebody to ambulate in a very goal-driven type of way? And how are we specifying and selecting furniture and equipment that can actually support that patient while they're mobilizing? Um, so there's less known about this in terms of research and specific design interventions, but an important component that's being studied. So medication safety is the next one, and many of us are familiar with some of the other USP chapters that tie into the design of healthcare facilities, often associated with sterile compounding, 797 and 800 are often at the tip of people's tongues. But there is a great chapter from USP that is chapter 1066, which is physical environments that promote safe medication use. And this came out in 2010. And one of the things that they looked at was defining a medication safety zone. And this is any area where medications are prescribed, orders are entered, and where medications are prepared, dispensed, and administered. So this isn't just about medication prep rooms. This isn't just about a medication cart. This is pretty comprehensive in terms of understanding where medication gets delivered and prepared and how to do that safely. So if we start looking at some of the basic components that are outlined in Chapter 1066 and reflected in the guidelines, there's four broad categories that are considered really looking at lighting, looking at interruptions and distractions, looking at sound and noise, and the organization of the workspace. So in terms of lighting, we really want to make sure that the lighting environment is suitable to the task, that there's not shadows that are cast in places, um, that we have an even level of illumination between, say, the top of shelves and the bottom of shelves to the extent possible. Um, you want to make sure that you're not designing in a way um, to make interruptions and distractions more prominent. So consider in older healthcare facilities where you have a central nursing station and often the medication prep area would just be a cart that's rolled out into that central area. There's lots of activity that's happening. It's hard to concentrate. But even within medication prep rooms that are more common in newer facilities, if people are coming in and out of the room or you have multiple people that are preparing medications at the same time, you still have an opportunity for interruptions and distractions. So really thinking through how will this work in the end? What is the workflow that, ha excuse me, that happens? Understanding the influence of sound and noise, really getting a sense of it's that unanticipated noise that can become a distractor. Lots of noise in the background can contribute to being distracted and really not being able to concentrate on the task at hand. And then the organization of the workspace. So we've heard about look-alike and sound-alike types of drugs, and clearly those need to be separated in very visible ways that become intuitive to people who are preparing that and, and doing the dosing, um, but also looking at how many people will be in the space. What are the medications that they are actually preparing? What is that workflow? How might that conflict with other people that are in the space if there's more than one person in that medication prep room or that medication space at any one time? You're really going to want to look at do you have an electronic system? How does the barcoding check happen? Where is the technology for that located? And how does that actually happen in a way that supports the workflow? If you're using unit dispensing, where is that located? And how does that actually facilitate medication delivery in terms of interruptions and distractions and making sure that it's the right dose at the right time? So again, a lot of times we're focusing on a specific space, but this can move throughout the unit. When somebody is doing bedside delivery and running that check with the, the barcode, we really need to make sure how have we designed space for that to happen? How is the electrical system set up to do that? Where is that reader actually going to be located? The last thing we want to see is what happens sometimes where workarounds happen and you have the barcode that's on the medication cart sitting on the outside of the room and the caregiver is actually scanning that barcode outside of the room and then going in and potentially doing something different when they're in the room, not by intent, 
just by accident because things happen. So again, we have an opportunity through design to make this safer. So behavioral and mental health is also an area of consideration that has been in the guidelines, um, but it was typically located in the psychiatric hospital section. And there's a growing recognition that our mental and behavioral health patients can be anywhere in the facility. So it's not just restricted to secure psychiatric facilities. We really need to understand harm in all areas of healthcare facilities. So whether it's an inpatient environment in med surge or an ICU, or whether it's in an emergency department or even an outpatient environment. It's not just about suicide. There's other types of harm. And especially when we start to look at workplace violence and aggression, active shooters, these are areas of increasing concern. So from a typical behavioral mental health perspective, when we're looking especially at secure psychiatric units, we're really looking at what are the different levels of risk and how in a mental and behavioral health type of patient, how might this tie into how often they're alone. So somebody is more likely to harm themselves if they're not with somebody else or they're not visible to somebody else. So you're really looking at patient bedrooms and toilet rooms where somebody is more likely to be alone as compared to an exam room where somebody may be with a staff member or a private office where somebody shouldn't be accessing that space. Um, there's a couple of good design guidelines that run through some of these different levels of security. Um, the naming convention may be a little bit different, but again, from a, a secure psychiatric type of facility, these are really important components to think about, but then also think about how might this apply to spaces within our emergency departments or other types of spaces within the facility. What we really don't want to do is over-design for safety and really aggravate any stigma that may already exist. So security, I touched on this in terms of um, active shooter and some of these other issues. This also ties into security, so there's some level of overlap. Really trying to understand what are the risks that you have, not only from a design perspective, but also with construction, and really looking at this from um, an all hazards approach. So what are all of the things that can happen within a facility and how do we try and design to understand what will happen in those different events? So it can be man-made events, it can be natural events. So you can have an active shooter, or you can have a weather condition so that we need to think through what are these different scenarios and how is the facility and the organization going to be able to respond to that? So if we look at the next slide, we can just look at some of the high level considerations that look at a layered approach. So you're really going to be thinking about how does somebody enter into the site? How do we control that? How does somebody enter into the building? What happens within the building? How are we preventing access, unauthorized access into different parts of the building? How are we protecting important information? How are we protecting hazardous components? And really trying to understand how does this also tie into a larger picture of how we're going to manage emergencies when they happen and coordination with other agencies and with other organizations within the community. So some of it is operational, but it also ties into how we design the facility as well. So there's certainly a lot to think about when we're designing for safety, and it's not like there's one specific prescriptive answer or one specific prescriptive process. The goal of the safety risk assessment is really to have that discussion and really think through what some of these different areas might be, what is best for the model of care that is being offered, for the patient population that's being served, for the staff that are working in the facility. And I think it's just important to recognize we all know that things are going to go wrong and we really have an opportunity to say there are things that we can do to directly prevent harm or at least reduce the level of harm that may happen in all of these different areas of risk. So many people say that they think about safety during design, and I think that's always going to be the case. It has always been the case, but part of the goal of the safety risk assessment is to think through this in a much more systematic way to make sure that we're not being governed by the loudest voice in the room or the strongest opinion or being so caught up in everything else that's happening during the design process that small things get overlooked that actually make a big difference in the end. So with that, I will turn it back to you, Heather. Thanks, Ellen. Um, Ken, thank you as well for the really helpful overview of the functional program and safety risk assessment and how they can be harnessed to help deliver safe and effective healthcare facilities. 
Uh, now, I've got a couple of follow-up questions for you. Uh, the first one is, what is the functional program cost, and how long should I expect it to take? So it's a great question, um, and the typical answer I would give is it depends. Um, however, I would uh, suggest to people to think about it in, in terms of two, two factors that are variables that would drive it is um, I have found the cost of fees, having a planner, having other um, experts involved in the process, the fee associated with developing the initial uh, version of it is between 1% and 2% of the overall project cost. I've looked at small projects, ginormous projects, and that's about where that lands, somewhere between 1% and 2%, which I think is a bargain when you consider the amount of directional information that you're getting. The other variable, though, is the complexity of uh, user groups that are involved. So if we're doing a simple patient unit renovation, um, and as I mentioned in my portion talking about workshops, that's probably two or three workshops worth of time, which could be done in two or three months. I have done functional programs for much larger projects, replacement facilities, and those take between nine and 12 months to complete. So those are the variables to think about uh, as you approach it. And, um, and, then, and then essentially uh, what you do is you you get your team together, you lay out your workshop strategy, and get people to commit to dates. And that's how you'll get it done sooner than later. Uh, following up on that, isn't safety really just about operational considerations and training? Doesn't this really just add to the overall cost of the budget? Yeah, so this is um, this comes up a lot. And I think it's important to recognize that, yes, there are policies and procedures that need to be in place to um, create a safe environment. But the built environment actually sets the stage for almost everything that we do. So again, think about that hand hygiene sink. If it's located behind a door, it's going to be less visible and less used. So we really do need to think about how the environment contributes to a safe environment. It's not the silver bullet. The environment itself is not going to provide the solution. It does need to be considered in the context of how care is being delivered. Um, but it's not, it's an important component and it's not just about training. Training is actually one of the, the lowest influential components to contribute to a safe environment. You can't just keep telling people to do something different. There really has to be a way to facilitate the type of thing that you're trying to see happen at the same time. So again, training is important, but it's not the be all end all. In terms of the cost, it's similar to what Ken was saying. There shouldn't really be extra cost associated with some of these um, considerations around safety. Some of the components that you select may contribute to cost. So for example, if you're using overhead lifts as compared to some type of a mobile lift, but the process should really be integrated into some of the other things that you're thinking about during design. So whether you're thinking about the safety risk assessment during your functional programming process and part of that workshop, or whether you're thinking through your safety risk assessment components during your typical design meetings, it shouldn't necessarily add burden and cost to the overall project. And, and if I could just jump in, this is Ken. I agree and, and should have clarified. When, I, when I'm talking about that 1% to 2%, that's 1% to 2% you're going to spend anyway related to fees associated with the project. So I don't see an added layer, if you will, of cost to the project for doing it. It's the timing. It's, it's starting it early on, being more comprehensive and thoughtful early on, and basically at shifting those dollars uh, being spent earlier on in um, the process. And I'll, I'll tag on to that. So there's um, the cost influence curve that people may be familiar with where it's much easier to influence a decision earlier on in the project. The further you get down into design and then into construction, 
there's some things that you just can't change. And those changes become more and more costly over time. If you have to go in and relocate a toilet after something is built, that's infinitely more expensive than figuring out that it needs to change when it's still pencil on paper or a line on a computer screen. And again, to look at the difference between the first costs and the operational costs, many of these components that we're talking about adding are going to pay for themselves within a very short period of time. And overhead lift is going to be more expensive, but most organizations find that the return on investment can happen within two or three years as long as it becomes part of the culture of the organization to use the lifts as it was intended. So the, the training is really to be used in tandem with the design is what you're saying? Yes, yes, it's all a system. Okay. Um, I've got a couple of questions about the teams required. Um, one is uh, about the SRA. Can it be done by just one person? Uh, Ellen, you mentioned a team approach is necessary, but what about for small projects? So there's two components to that. So we've gotten feedback since this has been introduced that so, you know, the facility manager, the person, the project manager for the capital project can just sit in their office and sort of write down a list of things that they did and check it off and say that it's done. But you're really missing the opportunity for what the optimal solution might be. And what might be right from one perspective might not be the best solution for somebody else. So if you look at, say, medication safety and medication delivery, you know, the location of where those prep rooms are or where those medication safety zones are may influence other aspects of the design. So if you're looking at the location of an isolation room, for example, you know, you may want that to be in closer proximity to a medication preparation area. So there's lots of ways that different members of the team need to have that conversation together. An infection preventionist may have one point of view and a pharmacist or a frontline nurse may have another point of view and really understanding how is this going to work when we actually occupy this building? What is going to be the best solution that addresses safety in multiple ways? So there's that aspect of the team. And then in terms of the smaller project, it's important to understand that this applies to all projects. It's not just big new construction projects. You may have a small renovation project and one person may fill more than one role. So your frontline nurse may actually be the person that's gonna let you know about falls of medication safety because she's the one who's actually doing that, she or he. And there's other people that may be involved at other points during the process. So again, it's really trying to understand what what does a multidisciplinary team look like for that small project? It may only be two or three people, but it's really important to try and gather more than just one perspective. A uh, quick follow-up to that, actually. Speaking of small projects, there are a lot of elements to the risk assessment. Um, this person wants to know, do I have to do all of them for every project, or can I just pick and choose based on uh, the size of my project and the complexity? So that's great. So um, the table that was earlier in the presentation that looks at the seven different components actually identifies where you need to be thinking about the different areas of safety based upon some of the different project issues. So um, security is always required. Infection prevention is already required, always required, sorry. Um, some of the other ones are gonna be um, context specific and project specific. So the example that I'll use with people, if you're doing a renovation for a kitchen, for example, you are not gonna need to do a medication safety evaluation. That's just not gonna be part of the project. So again, it's really understanding that table, um, being informed by the table and being informed by the scope of the project to understand what are the considerations. Okay, um, this one's for you, Ken. You mentioned that the functional program is the responsibility of the owner, but the common understanding is that it's the architect who actually completes the functional program, which is correct. The owner, uh, the owner, it, well, actually, who completes it is a multidiscipline team. The, uh, the entity that's responsible for the content is the owner. Um, as I mentioned, there's a lot of information related to operational strategies. I mean, just think about the items that, that Ellen covered. Um, and while, I, while architects um, and other planners are uh, fully experienced and capable of 
talking about and addressing, we want the owner to be responsible for the content. So they really embrace what's being uh, identified and agreed to and build that into their culture. Okay, thanks. And I, and I think I we've got add, time. Oh, I'm sorry, go I was going to add on to that in terms of the safety risk assessment. A lot of times there's questions that come up about, you know, who's supposed to manage it. And I think to Ken's point, you know, ultimately the owner, the organization that is providing care will be responsible for a lot of the decision making, but the actual management of the safety risk assessment process could be held by different people within the team as well. Okay, great, thanks. So uh, last question, what's required by an AHJ in terms of documentation? So for the safety risk assessment, um, since this was introduced in 2014, there's many AHJs and states that are still working through an adoption process, both for the 2014 and the 2018 guidelines, and this will vary by state. So I think it's important to ask your AHJ what their expectation is. Some will consider this to be very much of a discussion process with some type of documentation to support the work that you've done, but they want to understand how you're thinking through some of these issues. Um, others may have a different way of approaching it. I remember speaking to one AHJ who said, listen, I don't wanna see all of the backup of everything that you did. I wanna know that you did it, but you should have that backup if I have a question at some point during the project. And this is Ken, what, what I would, uh, I agree with, with Ellen and what I would add to it is that, you know, as we develop and update the guidelines, there are a number of AHJs that participate in that process and we have engaged them in the uh, dialogue related to this information we just covered. And what you'll read in the guidelines uh, related to content, which I've reviewed, my sense is that across the board, uh, that AHJs are expecting that level of documentation. The additional items that um, that I that I put on on my slides, um, those are subject to the individual. So it does vary by state, but uh, there seems to be a consensus amongst AHJs that the content we've described in the guidelines is really that is the essential components that they would like to see uh, when a functional program is submitted. Okay, thanks. That is all the time that we have for today. Thank you for joining us, and thanks to our presenters, Ken Cates and Ellen Taylor. Please remember to see the person who registered your site at the close of this session for information on receiving learning units or a certificate. You must be registered through MADCAD in order to take the survey and obtain credit. Here's a look at the complete webinar series that FGI is offering on the 2018 Guidelines for Design and Construction Documents. We hope that you'll be able to join us for each presentation. Keep current with what's happening at FGI, including updates on adoption, errata, and the 2022 revision cycle by signing up for our quarterly newsletter, the FGI Bulletin, or following us on LinkedIn. Thanks everyone, have a great day.